Welcome to Got It Right. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest today is Timothy Clark. Timothy is a sub three marathoner, a multiple finisher of the Ironman. He is also the founder and race director for Trimera Sports. He also hosts his own podcast called Personal Record. But his full time gig is being a member of New York City's fire department. I'm honored to have Timothy as my guest. Thank you very much for having me, Will. My gosh, you do it all. <laughs> I, you know, I try to stay busy. I was wondering about the podcast. Primarily, you interview endurance runners, or endurance athletes, I should say, mostly runners, occasional triathletes, because you have your feet in both worlds. Yes, I do, yeah. And there's so many podcasts. I was just wondering, geez, how many podcasts are there that are sports related? And there seems to be, if not dozens, maybe hundreds. There's a lot. And I remember I had a guest here, Roger Robinson, the, the historian. And he was taken aback that there's an actual show, a TV show about running, because in his experience, there are very, very few TV shows. I know there are a couple in Canada. There might be a few out in the rest of the country. But podcast is very, very different. So tell us, how did you start the podcast and why? I'm a big fan of podcasts in general, uh, of all variety, whether they are sports related or otherwise. Uh, I just enjoy listening to them. I listen to them a lot, you know, when I'm sitting on the trainer, riding a bike or out on a run or something. Uh, and it just had been an idea bouncing around in my head for years that I wanted to, I think it'd be a cool idea to interview New York City athletes and just friends of mine that I've gotten to know over the years and just kind of pick their brains and ask them questions that I might not otherwise get a chance to ask them. Literally the day after the New York City Marathon in 2017, I had some time in my hands and I started researching. How do you how do you do a podcast? How do you upload a podcast? How do you get it onto iTunes? How do, you know, what equipment do you need? Uh, what software do you need? Uh, and this was a, a multi-month, just hours spent online just researching how this all worked. And finally, at the end of 2017, by December, I think I had my first episode out. Interesting. So it's not a quick thing to do it over the weekend. You no, decide. I, you can do it over the weekend, but if you want to do it right, I think it takes you it takes some time, take some research. Okay. So what's the best piece of equipment that you need to do a podcast? Probably a computer. A computer. Yeah. I mean, you need your microphones, I, 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 everything really at the end of the day. It all it all comes into play, but the computer in terms of editing software, uploading it, storing it, storing all the data, uh, you know, quality mics are important, uh, mic stands some sort of interface to get the mic, you know, to get the, the, the audio into the computer. Uh -huh. uh, it all comes into play, but I wouldn't be able to do anything without the computer. Okay. And when you research, did they recommend a specific kind of mics? You know, there's so many different kinds of, you know, different kinds of sound collection. And you got to worry about room noise. You got to worry about things you never worried about, like uh, humming and different frequencies. You don't have to worry about lighting, the flickering. That's so not that, really. I do, I do record my interviews usually on a GoPro. So I do have uh, actual video recordings of almost all my interviews. Uh, but you're right. It, it's, it's a lot easier to work with audio than it is with video. You, that's that's a rabbit hole you can go down in terms of getting into the microphones. You know, you can either you can use something as simple as iPhone headphones, uh, which I've done in the past. You can spend thousands of dollars on microphones, which I haven't done. Uh, but if you if you spend anywhere between fifty and hundred dollars on a microphone, you can get a decent quality sound. Now, do you need two? One for yourself and one for the guests? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, for my show, I need I, I like to have my guest here with me. In terms of audio, can you do it long distance? Or? I've done both. Yeah, I can record via Skype. Uh, which creates its own issues. You know, there's like you need good quality internet connections at both ends. Uh -huh. uh, you're relying on the guest's uh, understanding of audio and what, you know, what sounds are going on inside their own room, um, which uh, most of my guests have been fantastic about that. They've been, they've been excellent. Oh, that's interesting. Skype, huh? Is there a, sometimes a delay? You know, you, you, you speak and then you have to wait sort of a a half a second before they hear you. Not so much a delay, but the the inner the reception gets a little wonky every now and then. So you'll have to like start a sentence over and just okay. edit it out later. All right, all right. Here you are. You're ready to do your first show. You you you've done all the research. Any any surprises when you did the first one? Like oh my gosh, anything like that? My first ever interview was actually with my brother, which I never intended to air. 
I just, I, he was a runner himself. So I, he was the one who got me into running. Like uh -huh. I, owe, I owe a lot to him. So I, I asked him, uh, you know, would you mind if I interviewed just kind of see how it goes? I have no idea how I'm going to be at this. I have no idea how this is going to work, if I'm going to be good or not. Let me, you know, let me save my, let me, if I'm going to embarrass myself, I'd rather do it in front of you than somebody else. So my first ever interview was with him, uh, which I ended up airing, I think my third ever episode. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and it ended up, it was just, it was fun. It was, I had such a good time. Again, I was asking my brother questions that I really never asked him before. You know, uh -huh. I was learning stuff about his running career that I had never known, you uh, know, and I was finding out uh, interesting things about him that, again, I just wouldn't have otherwise asked. Oh, these, this is just recorded. It's not a, a, over the radio or live, you know, you, you would, you would post them later and then let everybody know about it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you get a chance later. to edit it and sure, uh, sure. whatever. Yeah. Okay. What is that you have to edit out or edit in besides the intro, the music, I guess, and you probably do a little, I, I think I listened to two of them. You have a little voiceover. Sometimes you do a little commercial and then you got a closing, I guess, to, mm -hmm. to welcome people to come back. So edit, what, what else in terms of editing? You don't have to do lower thirds, like identify the speaker like we do on the on video. No, 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 I don't have to do that. I do a lot of editing, uh, just in terms of the sound quality, uh, trying to get rid of any ambient noise that might be in the room, uh, any sort of hiccups in the recording, whether, you know, I have had it where like somebody's baby's crying off in the corner, you know, where you have to like pause for a second. You know, I've had just fl mostly my, my own where I just, you flub a sentence and you're like, all right, let me, <laughs> let me start that one over and uh, you give it another shot. Sometimes I have to edit just for length. You know, uh -huh. I try not to let my episodes go more than an hour, uh, ideally like 45 minutes. But if the conversation's engaging and gripping, then I have no problem letting it go longer. Okay. Is there a limitation on the 45 minutes? It's just because of you, you want, don't want to lose your audience? Yeah, I just don't think anyone wants to hear me talk about running for more than 45 <laughs> minutes, you know? So I try to keep it, I try to keep it interesting. Okay, so you've got a sweet spot of uh, 35, 45 minutes, exactly. something like that, unless it's really engaging. Oh, great. So I think you've done about 27 in yes. the last, what's that, year and a half? It's about a year, coming up on a year now, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So so that's like averaging like like two a month? Two a month, about that, yeah. It's a lot of work. So <laughs> uh, which one was uh, the most memorable for any reason? <clears throat> They've all been memorable for one reason or another. You know, speaking with Matt Long, who was a New York City firefighter, which is near and dear to my heart, speaking with him about... Uh, he had a traumatic accident. He was hit, hit run over by a bus uh, and battled back to run the New York City Marathon and then do the Lake Placid Ironman. You know, to hear him tell his story of just survival was amazing. I interviewed Jeff Smith, who was the two-time winner of the Boston Marathon, 1984 and 85, which was just humbling to speak with some like a runner of that caliber, like he was in the Olympics, and just hear how humble of a guy that he can be. You know, Sarah Crouch, who uh, is a is a contributor to the Personal Record Podcast, is a professional runner who just finished Top American in Chicago this past weekend. Really? Uh, yeah, she's a fant fantastic runner, an amazing writer, and somebody that uh, has been contributing to the podcast. Does that mean she's been more than once on the show? She was a guest on the show, but she also contributes what I do, I call personal recordings, where I have uh, Sarah Crouch and Allison Goldstein, who's another contributor. Uh, they have, they're both prolific writers. They I have them read their blog posts that they've written. And so they'll just read off um, an article, about, uh, just just an essay about whatever it is. Oh, okay. So that'll know. be a podcast in itself? Right, right. Interesting. And how long would, would those little reading go? Five and ten, five to ten minutes or oh, so. Oh, okay. So you've got these, these moments. I have similar thing. I call them moments where we do anywhere from three to maybe as long as 15 minutes, depending on what the topic is. And those... Uh, those are uh, really focused. So you you do it differently. You, you have writers read about their stuff, which is really cool. Yeah, you get a little yeah. more exposure. Sure. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. You mentioned your brother. So let's go back to the beginning. Tell us where you were born and something about your growing up years. I was raised in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, born and raised there. Typical just working class, middle class upbringing in New York City. My father was a cop. My grandfather was a fireman. So it's just been all cops and firefighters all down the line. Interesting. You know, so the, the firefighter thing was always kind of on the back burner of something to do in life. I was, I was always athletic. I played tennis in high school. I played some club tennis in college. Uh, but then post-college, you know, I spent some time living in Colorado and, you know, ended up moving back home and I was bartending. And I just didn't really have any sort of structure around 2008 or so, uh, I, I started running. I just started kind of getting more and more into physical fitness and, and just liking how that felt and what that meant. And how old were you at that time? I was about 25, 24, 25. Now, you that. mentioned it in one of your 
podcasts or one of your writings that your brother was an influence on your writing. Yes. Uh, yeah. How did they influence you? So Mike is he was, older, by the way? yes, he's older. He's, uh, I'm the youngest of three. Mike is the middle one. Mike ran in high school and college, uh, and just would do things. He'd run a number. He's a sub three hour marathoner as well. Uh, he <laughs> runs in know, the family. Right. I guess he just introduced me to running, not initially just, just like the vocabulary of it. When I first got into running, I understood how long a track was. You know, I understood what a marathon was. I understood just a lot of the things that people don't understand about running. I knew because of him. So when I personally started getting into it, it was because of him that it, I think it was an easier transi transition. To say nothing of the fact that he was one of the per he was the person that brought me out on my first ever runs, my mm -hmm. first ever three mile runs, just to clear your head. You mm -hmm. know, the helped me sign up for my first races, and mm -hmm. and was just kind of an influencer in terms of me getting into the sport, me signing up for races, me understanding how that process worked. Okay, we also introduce you as the founder and race director of Trimara Sports, which I understand is a. Uh, it's a combination of triathlon and marathons. Yep, fuse the words together. <laughs> fuse the words together. I think they call that a word, a Frankenstein word. That's, that's right. <laughs> I think it's a Frankenstein organization. So that means at some point, uh, besides running, you got into triathlon. So where did the swimming and the biking come from? After, yeah, just a number of years of running, uh, I just was looking for the next thing. Uh, I just, I love the world. I love the sport. I love the people in the sport. Everyone was so engaging and so friendly and so positive. It was such a hard thing to do. And people would do it with smiles on their faces. And it just, it fascinated me. Uh, so in terms of Trimera Sports, my, my business partner, Mike Casper, uh, who owned a running store in Bay Ridge, where I worked for a time, had approached me and he wanted, he had this idea of putting on these races. And I said, yeah, let's do it. So we partnered together. We formed Trimera Sports. And now we have six events you know, in Brooklyn now. Bay Ridge Half Marathon, Holiday Half Marathon, a few 10Ks and Prospect Park 10K and a few uh -huh. other things. But yeah, after a number of years of running, I'd run uh, like five or six marathons at this point. Uh, I just, another buddy of mine had taken me kind of under his wing and was showing me how to, again, just how to, how to, how, how to run for real, you know, would take me onto a track and show that, you know, you don't just run around a track a couple of times. Like you have to, you have to hurt. Like you have to go into like a, like a, a mental state where this is going to be really painful and really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, he was at the time training for an Ironman, his first ever Ironman mm -hmm. in Lake Placid. And I just saw what he was doing and how he was doing. And I thought, that's so cool. I really I want to try that one day. That looks so hard. Like it just, it just, it, it was, it was a, a long, it was one step in a long process that was just, I wanted to try harder and harder and more challenging things. It, it just was that, a logical That was the Iron Man. Yeah. That, that was fascinating. Now, back in college, which, did you major anything specifically? Uh, I was a business administration major. That's business administration. So at some point, you know, you had, you needed, you decided to be a fireman and your dad was a fireman as well. And, you, and your uncles were in, in the field. I think your brother is, is a lawyer for the police department. He is, something. yes, yeah. So my father was a police officer. My grandfather was a firefighter. All right, all right. So you guys are really into the uh, police department and the fire department. My, so, my great, great, great grandfather was one of the first ever paid firefighters in New York City. Oh my gosh, it was a fascinating history. Okay, so, so what was the process of becoming, uh, entering the fire department? How did you make that decision? Well, these two worlds were kind of running in, in parallel for the longest time, uh, as I was uh, uh, training and as I was uh, just, again, getting into running, getting into triathlon, uh, the process of becoming New York City Fiber is a very long one. It, it takes years, literally years. Uh, it involves civil service tests and then medical exams, physical exams, and all these. It's just a long, long process. And so they both kind of fed each other. Uh, as I was, you know, as physical fitness was becoming a, a bigger priority in my life, I started to understand how physical fitness is should be and is a big part of being a firefighter. Uh, so those those two worlds eventually uh, kind of came together when I, when I joined the fire department. Okay, so they sent you a, a letter in the mail and do you look for a thick envelope to make sure that they got in or is it a little envelope? How do, how do you learn that you, you got in? Yeah, I, they just send you an envelope. Uh, thick so, one? I, I think it's a little one, <laughs> I, I don't remember. You understand that you're getting closer when they start calling you up for your like psychological exam, your physical exam. So you understand that, you know, they're working their names down this okay. list, you know, and so right. your number's so, coming up. So I guess the whole family showed up when uh, you got your assignment or what is it? Do you get a medal, not the, a medal, but a, a badge or? Yeah, I mean, you, you go through, uh, uh, if we did four months in the academy. So you go to the New York City Fire Academy out on Randall's Island, which is a pretty intense process. You know, a lot of physical fitness, a lot of, uh, again, just things that I enjoyed, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, just, but, and also just teaching you how to be a firefighter, how, uh, to, yeah, yeah. how to run, you know, just how to, how to put out fires, you know, oh, and yeah, just, yeah, uh, which yeah. is a lot more complicated than I think people uh, realize. Uh, well, we've seen the movies, we know uh, it's, it's, it's just slowly. like that crap.
And I know Randall Island, I, I've been there for cert training, which is uh, certified emergency preparedness, and they have a mock of buildings yes. and, and underground as well, which is so, so you could practice, I sure. guess, the auto sources stuff. Sure. Okay. But, you know, the fire department and the uh, police department, they have friendly sports survivory like the Fifth Avenue Mile, where I guess they got bragging rights. So who comes in first? Do so you participate in those kind of events? I missed the Fifth Avenue Mile this year, actually. But uh, yes, I try to as whenever whenever I can. There's the Fifth Avenue Mile is a big one. There's the NYPD FDNY Five Miler in Central Park is another big one. And the biggest one is the New York City Marathon. Oh, okay. So everyone everyone buys for each other. You know, everyone goes after each other in the New York City Marathon. Oh, okay. I know. I, I seen the uh, the shirts, and you also have uh, a. Charity events because I know a friend of mine who's a lawyer and he runs on behalf, I believe, the police department as, as one of their charity runners. So, so you know, you welcome other people to come in and, oh, yeah, uh, and course, raise yeah. funds. Yeah, yeah, it's not an exclusive club. You know, anyone who's willing to participate, anyone who's willing to be a part of it. Uh, uh, okay, welcome. but it's exclusive running the Fifth Avenue Mile because you don't want any ringers coming in. Mad, you have to, yeah, you have to. Med, eat. you're an honorary yeah. <laughs> park right, department yeah. guy. Just like Med, you know, wears his New York Athletic Club shirt and he probably never stepped foot in the place. <laughs> oh, oh this, this, this other big event every year, I think it's called the Run to the Tower or something like that. The Tunnel of the Towers. Tunnel of the yes, Towers, yeah, yes. you do that sometimes. That's, I've never actually run that race, but I've been one of the firefighters that stands along the side holding up the the pictures of of uh, men that died oh, on uh, 9/11. That is a tremendous uh, honor to, to be able to do that and, uh, and to be member. It's I a, think it's one particular firefighter. Stephen Siller. Stephen yeah. Siller. Stephen yeah. Siller. The story of Stephen Siller was he was in the tunnels when I, I guess I don't know if he was on his way to. I didn't think he was on his way to the towers when the towers fell. And he had just abandoned his car because he was stuck in traffic in the, the the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and just ran to. Uh, to the World Trade Center, yeah. where he, he later died. He perished. Oh, gosh. All right. So here you are. You're a busy guy. You know, you're, you're a firefighter. You're doing these podcasts every other week. Uh, you got the Trimera. How many events do you hold a year for that? We do six events a year. Every other month? It's, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. Time consuming. It's time you know, consuming you got, work, yeah. You got to figure out the permits. Well, I guess you got that down now to, you know, you pretty know what you got to do. You got, got the permits and you got the, uh, and sometimes you need um, political support because, you know, you might be, do you, do you are you closed down any of the streets or? We don't. That's really hard to do and very expensive to do. Uh, it, it's it's we would like to one day, yeah. but it's uh, we haven't we haven't quite gotten there yet. Uh, okay. Well, but yeah, well, even still, even even a, even just a parks race, uh, that's that's more or less as simple as they come. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility, a lot of liability. You have to make sure the runners are all going to be safe and cared for. Uh, make sure everything is cleaned up. Make sure you know. Make first and foremost, make sure everyone is safe. Second, make sure everyone has a good time, and make sure all of your responsibilities to the parks, to the city, and to the people in the area are all met. That's right. And you being a fire fire person, you know, you're probably more aware than most of, of, of safety. Yeah, I mean, there are certain signs to watch out for, but we tell our volunteers, we give them a little package saying, you know, watch out for people if they seem to be pale, if they're, you know, if it's a hot day and they have, you know, goosebumps, you know, okay. if they're shivering, uh, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, so I guess you have um, medical services nearby as we well. We do, yes. Okay, yeah. you, you need to hold. Now, are, are these uh, certified in the sense that be post and qualified. I, don't, I guess you don't have marathons. But we don't do marathons. Not do marathons, yeah. but uh, could be certified. You do half marathons. We do have marathons. Or yes. It could be certified, for example, to get into the New York Road Runners. They have you do a certain times. You can automatically get into to the halves. So if you're, to be honest, we're not uh, certified with USATF, which okay. we should, which we are working on, and we're trying to get that done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people volunteer to help you with with these things. I met a few of those guys. They're fantastic people. Okay. Any relationship with New York Roadrunners, do you know, in terms of uh, supporting your races? You know, I would love one day to partner with Roadrunner. Yeah. They are they are the well, industry standard. They are the people that kind of created this whole industry. That's so right. that's, well, maybe you've only been doing this a, a couple of years, right? Since, yeah, You're still young. Yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of future plans. What are some of your personal goals, athletically speaking? Is there a uh, an, an event, an Iron Man, or something that uh, you want to do? I think I'm retired from Iron Man. I okay. keep I keep saying this to people. I, I I raced very competitively for a number of years, and and I I 
had some things and I did some things I'm very proud of, uh, but it was amazingly hard. And I think, you know, it just, it took, it takes a lot to do an Ironman. It takes even more to do an Ironman at, at, a, at a high competitive level. And okay. it's, it's, it, it can really just take a lot out of you. Well, I think you told me you did one under 10 hours. I did, yeah. Which Ironman was that? I, I, several of them. Um, I did uh, all of them, actually. It was uh, Ironman Lake Placid, uh, Ironman Texas. I did the Hawaii Ironman, uh, Lake Placid again, and Ironman Mont Blanc up in Canada. The now, the one in Hawaii, is that the Kona? The, that's Kona, yeah. Uh, okay, that's Which the, is this weekend. It's coming that's up. The, that's the... Boston Marathon of Ironman. That is, yeah, and you it's, did it's that the place to go. Yeah, I did that in 2014. Now, supposedly that's that's a hard one to do. Versus, you know, they say Lake Placid is a good one for your first Ironman. So, so what's the difference between Lake Placid and Kona besides the quality of the team? In Lake Placid, there was a hailstorm on the bike. Like it was cold on the bike. It was windy. <laughs> In uh, Kona, it was about a million degrees, <laughs> and it was also windy. It was actually super windy. Uh, it, it, they're both actually pretty hilly. Uh, Lake Placid's obviously hillier, uh, but you're dealing you're in the Adirondacks. You're dealing with the mountains. You're dealing with mountain temperatures, mountain uh, temperature swings. In Kona, you're, it's heat. That's you're battling heat the entire time. But they probably start at crack of dawn, not even crack of dawn. They do, so but it's hot. I mean, it's no. They I think you start at six or six, yeah, maybe seven. I think it's seven a.m. You start, but it's already eighty-five degrees. You okay. know, and and you know, then you have uh, all right. A so 10 you hours both have your challenges. And you, yes. but the thing is, you, what was your fastest time? The one on Lake Placid or the one at Cone? Lake Placid. A little easier. Uh, it was just, it was just a better day. I had a better, better day. day. In Lake all Placid, right. Yeah. So that's interesting. You don't you don't just you don't say one is easier than the other. It gets a different day. But would you agree? Then I was told if you're going to do your first Ironman, Lake Placid is the one to consider. Lake Placid is a good one. To start. I I love Lake Placid. It was it was the best day of my life. I did it in July of 2014. It was I just everything worked out for me. Everything I had a great day. Uh, the community in Lake Placid is fantastic. They really come around to support the race. It's a very spectator friendly sport because it's multiple loops, so your friends and family can all kind of stay in more or less one spot and see you a number of times. Uh, the course is gorgeous, um, if you can handle the multiple loop thing, which yeah, I don't okay. mind. Oh, okay, uh, there are some, some minuses there. If you're, yeah, but there yeah. are flatter races out there. It's a, oh, it's okay. a tough one. Okay. All right, but with you know, Kona, you got to be invited. You just can't apply to it. You know, you got to have a certified certified time, probably ten hours or less. It's, I don't know. It's a, they do it by placement, so it's depending on in your age group. If you, it, it depends on the race, but you might be first, second, third, fourth place in your age group, depending on how many slots they're allotting to that race. Then you can qualify. Ah, uh, excellent. Okay, and then in terms of your podcast, if there's somebody you're dying to interview that. Uh, you, that you really want to do either either the next one or the future podcast. I've been I've been emailing Peter Chacha from the from New York Roadrunner. I've been uh, trying to send him some messages. Uh, <laughs> I would love to speak with him and just you know pick his brain about New York Roadrunner and and the history behind it, his history and you know, there's any number of people out there I would love I would love to speak with. You know, oh, okay. Shalane Flanagan is another one. You Shalane know. Flanagan. Gwen oh, Jorgensen. I think he's going to run again in uh, New York. Uh, I think, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gwen Jorka, she ran Chicago, but she was disappointed. In yeah, I didn't see, I didn't, I didn't get the whole story on her, but she, yeah, she ran New York and she uh, didn't, wasn't entirely pleased with her I think result. it was Chicago. She, she it was Chicago, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, we well, would we'll be interested in, to learn that story because yeah. uh, she had an interesting background. She's coming from a different, I guess she's coming from field and track. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, she was coming from triathlon. She won the gold medal in triathlon. Ah, okay. I knew there was something yeah. unique about her, a yeah. unique twist. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, yeah, I just, if, if there's anyone out there who's looking to get into running, you know, who's looking to uh, get into triathlon or any, in any of these endurance sports, I highly recommend it. It really helped shape who I am and helped shape my approach toward literally everything. Uh, it's made me a better person uh, and just somebody who wants to find the limit, who wants to find, who wants to do the next thing, who wants to do the harder thing. Mm -hmm. And so if there's anybody out there who's wondering, you know, whether or not they should get involved with it, I'd say 100% do it. There's people out there, it's a very friendly community. They'll take you in, they'll teach you how to do it. I think you won't regret it. All right. On that note, just do it. Thank you so much for coming Thank in. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it. It was a good time. Mm -hmm.